if everybody sees my slides, then we will get going. These are some of the gems that we had from our auriculotherapy uh, seminar, our live seminar with Dr. Raphael Nogier. We just had it last weekend. Kimberly and I were there. It was very exciting. We had a great time and we learned a ton of stuff. So we came back really excited to share with all of you. And so here we go with some of the gems. Uh, this is a quick overview of the things that we're going to talk about. We've got uh, <laughs> cauterization. That seems to be the most exciting, bizarre, strange thing we learned. And so we're going to hit that first just to kick things off and start with a bang. Then we have some other things, how the ear map was created, uh, look at uh, spinal palpation, root and branch treatment, and toxic scars and dental foci. So let's jump right into that. First of all, a quick review of auricular anatomy. Um, as you may recall, and I, I hope you all can see my pointer Kimberly, can you see my pointer as I do this? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so quick review then. When we talk about the ear, the outer curve of the ear is called the helix. There's, uh, there's superior, there's inferior, there's root of the helix. Then this inner curve here is called the antihelix. And then we also have the tragus. That's the little bump there in front of the auditory canal. We have the antitragus, which is opposite the intertragic notch. And then the flat section in here is called the concha or concha, inferior and superior. Just a quick review so that we've all got our anatomy down while we're talking about the ear today. Hopefully that's, uh, that's familiar to us all. And then the other thing I want to talk about is called the VAS, V-A-S. And... Right here, we have a picture of Dr. Nogier. He's taking the VAS, which is a pulse. He's taking that on Kimberly, and it stands for the Vascular Autonomic Signal. It is a reaction. It's a physiological reaction to stimulus, and it's felt in the pulse. And this is how Dr. Nogier does all of his diagnosis and all of his point finding in auricular therapy. So he's got the patient, he's got a thumb on the radial artery, he's feeling the radial pulse, and then he's feeling changes in the pulse. Now, this is not Chinese medicine pulse taking, which you would normally expect. This is just feeling with one location, feeling with the thumb, and feeling the pulse, and feeling how strongly it's pulsating, and then feeling for a change in that. If you have a stronger pulsation, that's the VAS, the vascular autonomic signal. And it does that, that, that extra strong pulsation can be in response to cutaneous stimulation, like on the skin, or it can be in response to emotional stimuli. It can be in response to touching various areas. And it's a sympathetic autonomic response. And the way the sympathetic system works is it's an all or nothing kind of response. So you don't get segmental responses. It's not based on dermatomes or nerve distribution. It's an all or nothing. You either activate the sympathetics or you don't. And so when you do something like flashing white light on the face, you feel the vas and you see if that causes a sympathetic reaction. You flash the light, you get a stronger pulsation. Um, and you do that several times. And that's one of the ways he tests to make sure that the VAS is intact and functioning. If it is not intact and not functioning, if it's not repeatable, then that indicates some problems that have to be addressed. And so, again, here is the picture of Kimberly. And there's Dr. Nogier sitting at the head of the table, and he's taking her VAS. And while he's doing that, then, he is providing various stimuli. He might shine light on her face. He might touch various parts of the ear. Um, and if it's not present, not normal. Uh, or if it's not present, then that's a problem. That means that that patient is not adapting properly. All right, next. With that in place, without understanding that the way he's testing things is by using the VAS, let's jump in and talk about cauterization because this is by far the most bizarre and interesting approach to auricular therapy that I have ever encountered. So I'm going to give you a quick history, quick overview of cauterization. 
prehistorically, I mean, this has apparently been done for thousands of years. And uh, you find, um, you know, evidence of this anciently. The first written evidence of cauterization appears between about the years 800 and 900 uh, AD, where you have in Arabic texts, you have doctors. And, and at that time, that was kind of the, the golden age of uh, the, the Arabic thinkers and scholars. Um, you have their textbooks, surgery, quite advanced work being done with medicine and surgery. And in some of the textbooks, you'll find discussion of cauterization, not only of points on the ear, but points on the body as well. And this, this picture that you see here is an actual picture from one of these ancient Arabic textbooks, you know, over a thousand years ago, showing cauterization of the ear. Now, the more modern history of cauterization, in 1850, there was a French textbook that was published. I won't try to pronounce the name of it. I'll just say it was a, uh, not a textbook, a medical journal. And in the medical journal, it reported 13 cases of sciatica that were treated with ear cauterization. And in those 13 cases, 12 of them resolved very successfully. Um, and for those that need a, a reminder, sciatica, low back pain that extends across the buttock, down the leg, down the back of the leg, it can, can go to the knee, it can go as far as the foot very painful, debilitating condition. And so something that treats it and treats it that successfully, well, that gets passed on and that gets used. Well, it was not really noted by Western medicine again after 1850 until 1950 when uh, we have a doctor, French medical doctor by the name of Paul Nogier. This is the father of Raphael Nogier. So Paul Nogier he noticed that he had several patients who had a scar at the same spot in their ear. And he asked him, how did you get this scar? And they all said, oh, well, that was uh, from Madame Barine, who, who treated that for my sciatica. She, she burned me there. She cauterized my ear to treat my sciatica. And she apparently learned it from her father, who apparently learned it from someone from China. And so... She was not a practitioner. She was a lay person, but she had been practicing this and she had been uh, cauterizing people's ears to help them with their low back pain. So this is folk medicine. This is, you know, this goes way back. And anybody, you know, who is modern and Western and scientific is going to look at this and say, boy, bring out the leeches next. And yet it seems to be highly successful to cauterize a certain area to treat low back pain and sciatica. Now, if you look at the picture of the lumbar spine or the picture of the spine as located on the ear, you can see that the spine is reflected. You have the sacral spine up here, and then it comes down and it transitions to the lumbar spine as it moves around the antihelix, then the thoracic and the cervical. And if you notice this area right where the lumbar spine and the sacral spine meet, it's in that area that the cauterization seems to be most effective. And uh, so did, did Dr. Nogier actually burn people's ears? <laughs> oh, yes, he did. Um, this is something he said, by the way, bloodletting, cauterization, scarring. Does that say scaring? Well, it's Halloween's coming. Uh, is not part of auriculotherapy unless it's used as part of a global comprehensive system. In other words, you're not practicing auriculotherapy. If someone walks into your office with sciatica or low back pain and you say, oh, I know, come here, I'm going to burn your ear. That's not auriculotherapy. You're practicing folk medicine at that point. Auriculotherapy, there's a lot more that goes into it to know when and where and how to use this treatment properly. So I'm going to just give you a quick overview. Here is uh, one of them that Dr. Nogier performed. This is a picture of an actual patient. And you can see the cauterization burn right there. Here's another one. Another one that Dr. Nogier did over the weekend in front of the whole class. Here are some of the pointers. Now, I'm giving you these pointers on the honor system. And here's the honor system. Don't go do this. Okay. What I need you to promise that you will do is not... Um, go start cauterizing ears 
or go start treating people with this unless you've been properly trained. I'm going to tell you some of the things that you need to know about this, but that's no substitute for proper training. So please don't go burn ears and please don't go lose your license doing this stuff. Done in the right way uh, with the proper legal um, disclaimers, it can be really effective. So what you need to do, number one, you must do the O prime point first. The O prime point is located just in front of the tragus here. And uh, often it's done on the right side, regardless of the side of the pane. And so you check that with an electrical point detector. If O prime isn't active on the right ear, then you check for it on the left. But Dr. Nogier would always put a semi-permanent needle called an ASP, uh, and he would insert that in point O prime before doing any cauterization. And that is to adjust for laterality and to make sure that the treatment is going to be effective. Secondly, you have to have a positive straight leg raise test. That's where the patient is lying on their back and you're lifting their leg with it kept straight. And if you can only lift 20, 30, 40 degrees and they have pain, that's a positive straight leg raise test. And then the other side can maybe go all the way to 70, 80, 90 degrees with no pain. That has to be present or else cauterization is not going to be effective. And that usually is present in cases of sciatica. Next, when you're palpating for the point and you're pressing, it will leave a small divot. It will leave a dent when you press on that point and it won't just spring back, but the dent will remain. And when you press on it, it will blanch due to vasoconstriction. When you press, it will turn white all around it immediately, much more than a point next to it. If you pressed here, you don't get the white reaction. If you press there, it turns very white immediately. That's how he locates the point. And notice that it is not on the actual ridge of the anti-helix, but it is actually down off the ridge a little bit. And if I go back to a previous slide here, in that one as well, you can see it's down off the ridge. So getting the right location is key. The point is painful to pressure, and he would press it several times. He wants to activate it, make sure it hurts. And after he's pressed it three or four times, he's watched it blance, he's seen the divot, he knows he's got the right point, then he would proceed to cauterize it. Uh, Kimberly, what's the best tool in the whole world for cauterizing ears? Because he says he's tried them all. What's the best surgical tool? You're going to tell him. Hold on, I'm going to show them. <laughs> I'm getting Kimberly by surprise here. You are. So he actually used a paper clip. He literally took a paper clip and he, um, remember when you were in college and you did moxa fire cupping and you did the cotton ball um, in the alcohol and you put the cotton ball on fire? That's what he did in a, um, in a tray and then he burned this paper clip until it was fiery red and then um, and then he burned the ear. He did note, he did note that if you tried to do this paper clip burning with a lighter that the toxins from the lighter would actually, you don't want to do it that way because you would actually leave a tattoo mark inside the ear. Because you'd so have stuck on have a, the paper clip. Yeah, so you wanted to have a clean burn and he did it in um, with the mock up. Yeah, here's his here's his magical tool right here. He used a paper clip. We we all just sat there with our mouths wide open. Yeah. And was... also I thought it was another thing is when you were talking about how they were finding the pain, the person on the table absolutely knew that they had found the right spot because it is very, very painful. So it's not just the blanching and but that person on the table, like their legs were lifting up and their face was grimacing. It was very, very painful. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. So out of all the out of all the surgical tools in the world, he uses a uh, a red hot paper clip, <laughs> and with great results. And we watched him do it. Um, I will add before we leave the cauterization topic that yes, it sizzles and. Yes, it smokes, and yes, it smells bad. You are burning flesh. And he would burn until he touched the cartilage. Now, don't burn through the cartilage. Don't come out the back of the ear or anything like that. But he would burn the skin until he got through the skin and touched the cartilage. It would take only a second. I mean, literally, he would just touch it about one second long, and that was it. Um, but 
that is the most extreme, bizarre thing we're going to tell you today. The rest of it is going to be a whole lot more uh, pedestrian than that. But uh, I wanted to share that, that that old folk remedy, the thing that kicked off auriculotherapy for Paul Nogier back in 1950, is still being practiced and is still very effective. And sometimes it gets people out of pain miraculously. Now, the, the effect can take several hours to several days. It might take a week to take full effect, but it's, it's really impressive when it does. And so we are going to switch back to Kimberly now, who's going to give us a new topic. I'm going to need to change you to a presenter, Kimberly, so give me a second here. Again, I apologize, folks, for the, uh, for the technical difficulties today, but there we go. And Kimberly... You are now a presenter. You should be able to share your screen now. Perfect. Are you seeing my screen? Not yet. Nope. Okay, I give me a second. Okay, I'm seeing your screen. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Kimball. I guess I can't tell that you're seeing my screen. I just need to trust. You're, we're okay. seeing Go ahead. All right, so one of the things that I found fascinating um, this weekend, how many times when you are in clinical practice do you do you find that patients are asking, well, how are these acupuncture points found? And all of us that were sitting there, we had never learned from um, Dr. Noje, and it was fascinating to see how the ear map was created. Um, obviously, a little bit of the history involved um, has to do with Paul Noje. Um, Paul Noje was Ralph, let's see, Ralph Noje was the father, Paul Noje, no, Ralph Noje is the son, that's who we learned from, Paul Noje is the father, and um, they call him the father of auriculotherapy, and as they were talking to us, and they were talking about all the different systems, as you're finding the different points on the ear, Paul Noje created the first mapping, which is the French system on the ear, um, the Germans created another system on the air that had to do with frequency and then there's the Chinese system which is quite interesting that system wasn't even developed um, originally with acupuncture and it all stemmed off of the work that Paul Nogier did in the beginning so um, as Dr. Larson was saying that the ear map discovery all started when Dr. Noje had patients coming and he read some of the research and he was very curious about this scar tissue on the air and it made him have questions and I have the number wrong on my slide, it was 1950, so a hundred years previous is when they had started doing this, or documented anyway, that they had started doing this cauterization on the ear for sciatica and really that's what got him questioning so he recognized that that particular point on the ear he had seen multiple pictures and had seen multiple multiple people who had the point um, cauterized and at that point he recognized that the that point worked and that was the, that was the beginning of his spine development can now I'm going to ask you, can you see my mouse moving? I'm noticing that I saw yours, but several people said they couldn't see it. Can I see, see it, Kimberly. Okay, uh, so L5S1, based on where that scar was, that was the beginning of the map, the whole auricular map. It all started there. And Paul Noget realized that if that was the sacral spine, were there other areas that involve the lumbar spine? And so because of L5-S1, that is how the rest of the map was created. And it all began from the scar and then the spine. And that was the first official map for auriculotherapy. Um, little trivia side note. I know that when I was in college, nobody told me that... Um, 
the Chinese didn't discover um, ear acupuncture. I just thought that was part of the whole um, Chinese medicine package, and it really was not. They didn't discover ear acupuncture. Um, they took interest in Paul Noget's work, and um, they used his map to create the foundation. And I know that when I was doing all the the research for Auriculo 3D, there were the Chinese points and the European points. So it was, it was. Um, there were definitely differences, but um, according to this seminar this weekend, we learned that that whole beginning started with Paul Noget's map. So Shen Men wasn't even created until 1958. So there aren't, um, there's not documentation of that fabulous point on the ear Shen Men until then. And then in the 80s is when ear points were um, bundled in with regular acupuncture treatments, and that was because of barefoot doctors. It was really interesting to read, to hear the history um, from Dr. Noje at this conference. So back on track here now. So after he discovered the spine map, that's when um, he went into, he, he recognized the vas, um, the cardiac reflex, which Dr. Larson, I spelled it wrong there, which Dr. Larson talked about earlier. So what he realized at that point was that when he touched certain points on the ear that there were pulse changes. Um, he could feel a pulse and he could touch certain points on the ear. When the pulse changed, then he knew that certain areas were pathological. And at that point in time, he didn't necessarily recognize what the pathologies were, but he knew that pathology could be recognized on the ear. And um, within that time in history, they were beginning to recognize that organs have electrical properties. So as he um, recognized that, he began introducing electrical properties to the ear to see how the pulse would respond. And the way he did that is he had vials with organ tissue. And they would, he would have the pulse and he would take the vials of organ tissue and introduce it at the ear and when he found the pulse when he when he was able to make the change in the pulse with the vial of tissue that's when they knew they had the right point did you want to expand upon that adrian at all no so with far you're good they would yeah you, okay. they would have the patient holding a slide actually with with a tissue preparation on it and then they would touch various points on the ear until they got a reaction and that's how they would know that that point on the ear responded to that to so talk about fantastic um, exploration of energy medicine so as what they did was all of a sudden this map start started getting bigger and bigger they took nervous tissue nervous system tissue and they found the areas on the ear and then endocrine system and reproductive system and eventually we have this huge map of the ear that tells us so much about the body and it was fascinating to it was fascinating to learn that process and it's kind of a fun story to be able to explain to your patients um, how that happened. I know it's not something that I learned in my original training. We are going to move over to spinal palpation and hope you're all ears. This is a guy that we met at the seminar this this last weekend and he came on the first day and he had these great big ears on his uh, on his head because he was there ready to learn about auricular therapy. So we're going to pass it over back to Adrian now and Adrian will talk about that. Okay and so here we go. You should be able to see my slides here. Spinal palpation is next. Um, but yeah, the history about how they made the ear map and the science, how they actually tested stuff. It wasn't that they simply made it up with the inverted fetus and said, oh, well, then this must be here and that must be there. But they actually could test it reproducibly and find that that's what it was. Well, as part of that, then there was a spinal map created. You've all seen this map on the spine. We've got the, the sacrum starting up here at the top of the antihelix, lumbar, thoracic and cervical spine. And, you know, spinal palpation, that's something that as a chiropractor, I would, 
I would expect to you know learn about, talk about, and so on. But finding the spinal points on the ear can also be done by looking at landmarks on the ear. And this is something I didn't know. Thought it was really interesting. So I'm going to pass that along here for how to find the right spots on the spine by looking at the landmarks on the ear. So here we have an actual ear. Can anybody guess whose ear that is? No one? <laughs> That is Cameron. He works here in the office. He had great landmarks, and so he took some pictures. Now, I've got these arrows here on this ear, and what you're seeing is, look closely, everybody, and can you see how we have light-colored skin between the two arrows? We have this kind of light band, and then there's an abrupt change here. It is now no longer the light color, but it's more of a deeper red skin, and it moves around, and it, and it changes color. It also, there's a change in the actual anatomy. You have that, that light skin is actually hard cartilage. And then when it moves, it becomes softer where that second arrow on the right there is. Um, hopefully you're, uh, you're able to see that. Okay. Um, that area shows us the, the lumbar, or excuse me, the sacral spine and where you where you come across here, excuse me, no, sacral spine is up there, lumbar spine, I'm sorry, sacrum back in here, lumbar spine right across here, and then when we hit that point where the, where the tissue actually changes, and you can feel it, you can palpate it, you could actually take a ballpoint pen with the ink retracted, and you could roll over that, and you could feel it hit the difference right there. When you feel that, that is the junction between the lumbar spine and the thoracic spine. So going back a slide, you can see we have that lumbar spine area and we hit that junction and we have the thoracic spine area. And so moving forward then, the next landmark, if you're looking for the spine, is right here. You can see I've got these two arrows or these two lines drawn and the lines are kind of crossing and intersecting like this. And those lines, you can see that this line, the top line, or the line on the left, if you can't see my pointer, it follows the curve of the antihelix. And then the other line kind of follows the curve of the bottom of the antihelix before it hits this antitragus, this little tubercle sticking up here. The antitragus is not part of the spinal map on the ear. All right, where those two lines cross, where you have the two sides of the curve and where they meet at the apex of the curve, that is where the thoracic spine ends. So we had lumbar up here, thoracic coming around, and then it ends right there. And at that point, that natural crossing point of the two lines, we begin cervical. And the cervical continues down until you hit the antitragus. And so that's how you can quote unquote palpate the spine and find your landmarks and know that you're on the right spots when you're working with the spine. And so I put dots up here on the ear. You can see these three points one is the junction of the sacral spine with the lumbar. And then the second dot is the junction of the lumbar spine with the thoracic spine. The third is where the thoracic spine meets the cervical spine. And so those landmarks right there, if you can find those, you can find spine on any of your patients. And that's always useful because how many of you deal with patients who have some kind of back pain, spine pain, or something spinally related? there you know you're in the right place and you'll get it right every time. So again, I want to go ahead. Add to that. I'm glad you brought this picture up. So this is sort of a visualization that you should have memorized and understanding that you have that little bump there. We all, all of us as acupuncturists sat there and went, oh wow, this is really big when you are looking at the ear and you want to um, do a quick treatment. Because recognize the cervical spine is actually a pretty big area in comparison to the thoracic. So if you were just trying to look at dimensions in relation to Ola, cervical spine is smaller, thoracic spine is bigger, and think break it up in that direction. It's not quite that way. You actually have little landmarks so you can take that space and um, analyze it better when you're treating. And that little bump just to find um, right where the thoracic moves on to lumbar, it's, it's just, it was fabulous to learn that and something that you could take back and use in your clinic immediately.
Absolutely. And that's one of these little gems we wanted to put up. Make sure that you knew that and how to locate it. So thanks, Kimberly. And speaking of Kimberly, we are going to move back to you now. Let me uh, change over and make you presenter so that you can teach us some more stuff. So just one second here. And there you go. You should be able to show us your screen. All right. Can you see it? Yep. Go ahead. All right. Root versus branch. So I am going to share with you in this next segment something that if, you know, you always go to a seminar and you'll get a whole weekend worth of stuff and sometimes it can be overwhelming. And this is the kind of seminar, I'll just have to say here real quick, this is the kind of seminar where you learned so much in that weekend. This was my first time attending and I met people who have been attending it year after year after year because they just keep going back to get the next bit of gem. He always adds new stuff but just even expanding on that treatment. This is the one thing that I'm going to show you next that I came back and used in my clinic the very first day I was treating patients and the results that I um, received from this were absolutely phenomenal and um, it's something that I could use right away and so I hope that with this webinar that I'm that we're sharing today that this is something that you could take back today and use in your clinic so this is a quote from Dr. Noje um, if you do not know there are two kinds of points you will miss the problem this was the quote that um, that I will keep in my mind forever because it is not the way that I used to practice auriculotherapy. He says, first start with electrical stimulation, then the reflex point. And I'm going to explain that I was doing it all wrong. I came back and I realized that what I was doing, um, and you've seen me do webinars, you've seen me, um, you've seen me do webinars often and talk about the great results I get for auriculotherapy, I did get good results. And then I learned this and then I got amazing results. So um, I hope that you're excited for what I'm about to share you share with you. So before the seminar, this is this was my step, my procedure, and this really is my absolute favorite uh, protocol in auricular 3D, shoulder pain and I'll just clarify here. When I say shoulder pain, I mean neck pain, I mean shoulder pain, I mean scapula pain. All of these issues are what I treat with this particular protocol. First, I would open Auriculo 3D. I would take my Stim Plus Pro. I just had to pull one out today. This is a shiny new one right out of the box because we're so excited that we have them in stock again. So I would take my Stim Plus Pro. I would turn it on. And then I would scan for the active points in the ear. I would find the ones that were active and painful. I would treat them. I would put ear seeds on and um, have the patient go, wow, how did you do that? And have the patient press on those points when they went home. And I'm telling you, that was a very effective treatment. I've been teaching people how to do this for years. And I would get great results with it. But I was doing it all wrong. I, it, it can be so much better than that, I'm going to now teach you. So um, after the seminar, I came home and um, I learned that there was a root treatment when treating the ear and a branch treatment. So on the root treatment, Dr. Noje calls them neurovascular points or skin resistance points. So skin resistance points means if you're using your Stim Plus and um, you're finding points that are electrically active. Those are skin resistance points. They are not the same as painful points. They are electrically detectable. Um, he, th there are multiple types of devices. The Stim Plus is very effective at finding them. Um, when you are finding these points on the ear, when you're scanning the ear with the Stim Plus to find them, if you were doing VAS on the pulse, those points would also have a vast, um, a vast reaction. 
So what those points, as you're finding them, they're electrically active and there is a pulse reaction with them. It tells you that there's a dysfunction in the organ system. Um, and that's similar to what I love about it. It's similar to when we graph the patient. We graph the patient to find imbalances in the organ system. Well, this is similar to how I treat an acugraph. So it's fascinating to think on the ear. When I... Um, when I scan for these points on the ear, it tells me what's happening in the organ system. And you always do these points before pain points. So ignore the spine, ignore all of the areas of pain, the knee pain, the sciatic pain, everything else. But you're going to scan the ear um, in the organ area. And you're scanning and you're looking for the electrically active points. And he explained that when you treat these points, they have an effect on immunity. They have an effect. Th this is the type of treatment you would do if somebody came in for depression, anxiety, constipation, digestive issues, hormone issues, whatever those types of issues are, this is the first step. So put pain aside for a moment. This is the first step of what you're going to do. So um, I actually recognized in Auriculo 3D, if you bring up your chart that says organs, these are the general points. And notice how the air, the main area where these points are is in the center here, in the center of the ear. Um, he said, well, let me go back. So he says, when you're scanning for these, really you should only find about two or three of these points that are active and you want to treat them. And sometimes you'll go in to scan and you won't find any active points. So what you will do first, if you don't find any active points, you will, try, you will first treat point zero with your Stim Plus and then you will treat Shen Men. And then if you scan again, those, um, those neurovascular points or skin resistance points will just magically appear. They'll just come to the surface. So I did this when I got to my um, clinic on Tuesday and um, regardless if I was treating pain or any other condition, the first thing I did was I scanned the ear um, of the organ points. If they were not active, I would treat point zero and Shen Men and then I would scan again and I would choose about two to three points and treat those points. This is not something where you're doing a lot of points. Only two or three points will, will really show up and they'll be really active. You don't have to push really hard with your Stim Plus to find them, especially if you've treated point zero and Shen Men. It's literally just a scan through the ear and they'll just come to the surface and you treat them. Uh, I treat just like I always would for about 10 seconds each. So then next is the branch treatment. So you've now treated the root cause of the problem. You've treated the underlying internal issues that are going on. Now you move on to the pain points. So if you don't have pain, you would stop there and be done with the ear treatment. If the patient does have pain, which most of mine do, shoulder pain, sciatic pain, whatever their issue is, I would move to this next step. After I did the first step, I'd move here and I would look for the painful points. Um, he gave a couple of ways of finding the painful points. You can just use a pressure probe and you can um, probe around. So I just brought up my typical shoulder pain protocol, but the spine, I would definitely um, look for painful points along the spine. The Stim Plus Pro is also fabulous for finding these. Just remember to do them after you have done your root treatment. Um, then you treat those points and you can treat them with a Stim Plus Pro and then you place seeds on them so that the treatment will have prolonged a prolonged effect. Um, Dr. Noget uses the ASP needles and that's something that I haven't used a lot of in my clinic and I'm going to experiment further with them. But I just want to say on my, um, my first day in the clinic, Patients were amazed. I was doing this. I would graph my patient first, and then when I, they told me about the areas that they had pain, I would follow this sequence. This is all that I did, and before I even put them on the table, 
to begin the treatment, their pain would already be gone. Whether it was shoulder pain, whether it was headache, whether it was low back pain, it was fabulous and exciting. My patients were excited, I was excited. And if this is the one thing that I learned this year from Dr. Noget, uh, my whole five days was completely worth it because I've already had referrals based off of this um, thought process going on here. Let's see, next, um, I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Larson and he's going to talk to you about toxic scars and dental focus and again this is a whole nother element. There were so many layers to the elements that Dr. Noget taught and this was fascinating as well and you are going to be excited. Cool. So to recap the two kinds of points, there are points that are electrically active that are for the organ and for internal stuff. And then there are points that are painful and those are for pain. And you have to detect them different ways and you have to treat them differently. And if you're not doing both, then you're only doing half the job. Did I get that about right, Kimberly? You're not doing as well as you could do. I mean, something that could be good could be amazing instead. And he did say that those that step one, sometimes, like 10% of the time, those points could be painful. So don't be surprised if some of them are painful, but 90% of the time they are not. Okay. And before I jump into the scars and dental foci, I, I wanted, I'm putting a link up in the comments here. Again, folks, we're just running on the, uh, on the fly here. I had all this prepared in our other webinar platform. And, uh, unfortunately it wouldn't, it wouldn't connect today. We don't know why. And we pay for that service. So we want to find out, but I put up a note that says acugraph.com slash notes. What that link is for is this is the notes from Dr. Nogier's class, 156 pages of all of the slides and everything that was, that was taught. We printed up enough of these that we had a few extra. There's like 10 extra. And if you want a copy of this, a hard copy mailed to you, that's a link you can go to and buy a hard copy of this. There's only like 10 of them. Um, when they're gone, they're gone. And so if, uh, if you want a copy, that's where to get it. Um, we just, we had them around. And I thought, why would we throw these away? Uh, we don't, we're not charging a lot, you know, just enough to cover our, our printing and so on. So if you want the notes from Dr. Nogier, that's where to go to get them. Okay. Now that we said that, let's talk about scars and dental foci. All right. First of all, here we have the picture again. Here's Dr. Nogier and he's doing the VAS on Kimberly. And that's how he monitors everything. So while he's got his thumb on the pulse, then he will stimulate various things to look for a reaction, a response. And so what he looks for first is he looks for the exhaustion phenomenon. Now, what this really means is you're going to shine light in the patient's face over and over, and you're going to see how they react if you keep doing it. Um, you don't need anything special. You could use the light on your cell phone. You could use a flashlight. Um, here, I've got a flashlight right here. And so it's literally, boom, like that, on, off, on, off, on, off, on. And each time the light is flashed on the face, it's supposed to cause that pulse reaction, that stronger pulsation in the pulse. And if you turn on the light and you leave it on there, then you'll get two or three of those, boom, 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 before it comes back down. Now, if you do this three or four times and pretty soon you're no longer getting a reaction, you shine the light and nothing happens in the pulse. That's called a vas exhaustion. And the exhaustion phenomenon means that there's either a toxic scar, a dental focus, or some other pathology. But the most common are the scars and the dental foci. And if you, uh, if you have that pathology, it's got to be treated before you're going to be able to do anything else. So here's the way that you do that. After you flash three or four times, if it starts to weaken, you know that there is a vast exhaustion phenomenon. You're going to start looking for toxic scars and dental foci. Beginning with dental foci, hopefully this is something that you are all familiar with or you've at least heard of. This is a dental or peridental pathology. It can be an infection. It can be painful or not painful, uh, visible or not visible. It can be old or new. It can be uh, present in a tooth that was extracted years ago. 
and there's no tooth there anymore, but there can still be up in the bone, up in the nerve root, um, a point of infection with anaerobic bacteria, um, scar up there, uh, something that is causing a problem. And that's also very common with root canals. Um, it's common with extractions. It's even common with healthy teeth. You can have that going on. Your mouth, of course, is, is full of bacteria and uh, you never know. And the way that you do know is that you test. And so, oh, and a dental focus will affect an associated organ. And this is important because that organ is not going to function or behave normally until you have addressed the dental focus. And so what you do then, oh, sorry, some of the, I'll, I'll get to the procedure, but some of the uh, effects, if there is a dental focus, number one is fatigue. How many of our patients come to us with fatigue? It's huge. Everybody is lacking more energy. And that's why the, uh, the five-hour energies, those little shots and the Red Bulls and the energy drinks is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. I mean, the amount of money that's made trying to sell people energy is insane. Um, hypotension, not hyper, but hypo, lack of function. Uh, pain, shoulder, tendinitis, pubalgia, uh, pain in the groin. Urinary infections, hair loss, and high uric acid. These are all associated with dental foci. And if you have a patient with any of these things, then that should be a red flag. Check for this stuff. And so what you do is, um, where are my pictures of that? Okay, here is Dr. Nogier. And as you can see, he's holding the vas on this patient with his left hand. And then with his right hand, he is just touching the roots of the teeth about like this. He's just scanning around, not pressing hard, and he's just looking to see if there is a vast response when he touches. And as he's going along, if he touches right here and there's a pulsation in the pulse and he feels that, he says, okay, there's a problem right there. There is a dental focus right there and that needs to be treated. Um, let me jump back in my slides here now to what he does is there are these points here. You should see my picture of my ear with some little points and he will scan each of those points by touching it with a little probe to look for that vas reaction. And when he finds it, then he will place one of those semi-permanent needles, those ASPs in there. And they come in a little um, applicator tube. So you just put it on, you click it, it shoots it in there and the semi-permanent needle stays for a couple of weeks until it falls out. Uh, it actually goes in, it punctures the skin, it's got a barb and it stays there. And it's just a little, little metal dot that you'll see on once it's been put in. And that should clear up the VAS signal from the dental focus. So you go back, you test that spot again, see if there's a VAS. If there is, then you have to recheck. And there's sometimes two or three in the same area that all have to have a needle put in them and then that vas will clear up and you have treated that dental focus so that it's no longer having an effect on the nervous system. So you also have to look on the organ points on the ear to see if any of those are affected same way by stimulating. And if there is, then that target organ point needs to be treated, not with an ASP, but with stimulation. You can use um, electrical stimulation, light stimulation to treat the organ that's associated. But all of that is detected with the VAS by checking that pulse while stimulating areas. Um, similar scars are treated in a very similar way to a dental focus. Now, the first thing you need to know about scars is what I called edges of the ear, okay? And what that means is, do you see the areas that I've got here in red? These are the scar areas. And I didn't bother labeling them all, um, but they, they're they actually, and in, in the notes he labeled them all, and various areas of the body. So a scar in the knee, for example, or a scar in the abdomen would appear in a very particular spot. And so he scans all of these areas looking for a VAS signal. And if he finds it, in goes an ASP to treat that scar. Um, so edges of ear, that's what I mean. It's around here. It's here on the tragus. There's, there's various edges that you look at. The right ear is for the anterior side of the body. So a scar on the front of the body will generally manifest on the right ear. A scar on the back of the body will manifest on the left ear. Wow, I didn't know that. That's one of those little tidbits I picked up at the seminar. And scars respond to black. 
Here's what I mean by that. Let me see if I can get a picture up that's good enough to see it. All right, on this picture, laying on the table, and I'm pointing at it, and I'm trying to move the pointer slowly, you can see a little white thing. Can you guys, can you see that, Kimberly? Is that there? Mm -hmm. Okay, and what that is, I don't, I don't have one here I'd show you, but I'm going to use my pen. This is the handle. That's the white thing. And then there's a white plastic pointer sticking off one side of it. And there's a black pointer off the other side. You have So it's like a little double-edged pointer with a black side and a white side. And here in this picture, you can see Dr. Nogier. And maybe you can even see the black pointer there. And you can see that he's holding the black side against the patient's ear. He's scanning the edge of the ear, looking for that spot to treat the scar. And by using black, what that does is it effectively blocks light. And he spent a great deal of time talking about how the skin has photoreceptors and how all mammals respond to light, even if they're blind. That light changes things, that you have this vast response. He talked about studies that were done with blind rabbits and found all kinds of effects of shining light on them, even though they didn't have eyes. Um, so using black, blocking light, and it has to be black that you use. And it can be this plastic thing. It could be a charcoal pencil. It could be a black crayon tip. It just has to be black. So scanning the area, you'll find a spot where you get a vas, and that's where the ASP goes to treat that scar. And so uh, that's what I put here in the notes. If you find an active one, you treat it with that needle. There are the scar areas again, areas that you scan with the black probe. And uh, there's Dr. Nogier doing it. And then he's about to put in the, the needle. He does this before anything else, because remember this all started with vas exhaustion, right? Remember me shining the flashlight on my face? If the vas isn't responding properly, repeatedly, over and over and over again, then you can't find and, and fix anything else. So you've got to fix that vas exhaustion, which means you've got to fix the toxic scar or the dental focus first. So I, I thought that would be a great tidbit for today because it's something that you've got to do first. One other thing I wanted to say about the vas. Oh, whoops, we'll jump ahead. Didn't want to get too ahead of myself. Here he is putting in the needle. Um, that little ASP on the spot that he found, click, and it goes. Now, if you can't do the VAS, but it's it's easy to learn. A lot of us were learning it right there in class. It's it's something that, you know, you can feel the change. But this I would equate with some other feedback mechanisms that are used by other kinds of practitioners. Many of us probably use muscle testing of some sort, or at least we've been made familiar with muscle testing. And it's a stimulus response system. And there are other ones, various approaches. This is his stimulus response system. And I think it's likely that whatever stimulus response system works for you and that you're most familiar with, you could probably do the same work. The advantage of the VAS is that there is a neurological connection. He spent a lot of time on the science behind this, why and how it works, why and how it was discovered. And so you've got some nice validation there. Okay. Adrian. Yeah, go ahead, Kimberly. Uh, before you move on, I think one of the things that just was really an aha moment for me, obviously, ear points on the ear, you could treat a single ear point on an ear and go, wow, that ear acupuncture really works, and you could get a, a result. And then you could get a little more advanced, you know, and use a stim plus and find electrically active points and go, wow, now that ear stuff really, really works. When you walk away from Dr. Noget's seminar, you realize that he is using a systematic approach. He's finding blockages from an internal aspect. He's finding toxic scars. He's treating the organ systems, and then he's treating pain, which is so similar to how we treat with AccuGraph and finding the imbalances um, on, our, on our root level. It, it just and then a branch level to make it so much more effective. And I was just fascinated by the many levels and the in-depth understanding that he had. Um, it's not just a matter of point and treat, which works, that works. That's why people love auricular therapy. But if you really want to expand your knowledge to the point of 
understanding the body at a much deeper level and really curing problems that could be cured forever, which he gave so many fantastic stories of problems that were cured forever and immediately. It was just fascinating. Sorry. I'll no, stop now. That's great stuff. Um, and we've got some questions coming in. I'm going to address questions here uh, and then we will, we'll be wrapping up here soon. Um, but did we hit Kimberly, do you have any other topics to hit before we jump into the, the Q and a stuff? No, I think I covered all of the topics. Okay. Uh, let's see. Betsy says uh, she has a patient that was taking baby aspirin um, for blood thinning and an ASP needle caused bad bleeding. Yeah. If your patients are on blood thinners, I wouldn't recommend ASPs. What you can do is an electrical stimulation like with a Stim Plus Pro followed by taping on a seed of a carrier seed and that will provide continued stimulation on that point. And that would certainly be an acceptable substitute. I would add, by the way, that um, many of you may not have a Stim Plus Pro or maybe had one a while back, but they've been out of stock for over a year. They are back in stock. If you need one, this isn't a sales pitch today, but I just want to let you know, if you do need one, StimPlusPro.com, you can get one. It'll be shipped today. Okay. Having said that, Brian said, do earbuds give the same response as the ASP needle? I assume you mean seeds by that. And yes, um, the ASP will usually stay in longer. And so you'd want to keep a seed on that spot and keep replacing it probably for the course of a couple of weeks. But yes, you can get just as good a response. Somebody did ask Dr. Nogier and he said electrical first followed by a seed is a great alternative for ASPs. Um, somebody said, can someone write in the address to the notes? Uh, I'll do that. If you mean the notes to what we're doing right now, um, no, that hasn't been posted yet. The recording will be reposted. If you mean the notes from the seminar, acugraph.com slash notes. That's where we have the books for sale, the remaining notebooks from Dr. Nogier's class with all of his slides in it. That's what's for sale there. And like I said, I don't even know, maybe they're sold out by now. I don't know. We had 10 and, um, we put that up just cause I hate to throw them in the dumpster. I'd rather see some people read them and get some use out of them. All right. Uh, any other questions that we can address? I wanted to put this up right here. Um, next year's seminar. If anyone's interested in coming, uh, it's October 12th to 14th. It's uh, Johns Hopkins University, Rockville, Maryland. You can fly into the, any of the D.C. area airports. There's three of them. And there's more information at auriculotherapyseminars.com. That's the website if you want to go next year. And the other thing that I will share is, oh, go ahead, Kimberly. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I wanted to share was this. I've gone several years in a row. And this year, it really clicked for me. Um, something that you might find interesting is the aha that happens because you've spent two days talking about the autonomic nervous system and the VAS and light stimulation and dental foci and, and all of these kind of disparate things and a lot of science behind them. And you're going, why is he telling me all this stuff? When are we going to talk about auriculotherapy? Why, why am I learning all these seemingly disparate things? And then he starts the demonstrations and you see him do exactly what it is. And now you know why he's doing it why it works, why there's this order to it, and boom, it all comes together, and you're going, oh, now I get it. Holy cow, that's what he was talking about. And then he was just treating patient after patient after patient, problem after problem, uh, just rapid fire. He didn't spend more than five minutes with any one patient up there, and uh, that was fascinating. He couldn't do that on day one without giving all that background. So we picked some of our favorite tidbits. That's what this webinar was about today. Uh, hopefully there's something that you can take and use. Um, any other questions? Uh, Ferry keeps asking over and over for a link for the notes. Uh, Ferry, if you scroll, it is in there. It says acugraph.com slash notes. Click it. It's a link. I'm going to put it right here again just to make sure. There it is again. Are we all seeing that? I hope I hope everyone can see that. Very good. You see it now? 
Sorry that that wasn't up there for you before, Ferry. Thank you, because I bet you weren't the only one with that question. So thanks for putting it up there. Accugraph.com slash notes. Um, any other questions that we can address before we sign off today? Uh, go try this stuff. Try doing the toxic scar thing. Try doing the dental focus thing. Clear those things up first. See if that doesn't change your results. Remember, there's two kinds of points. Treat them appropriately. Uh, see if that doesn't improve your results as well. And uh, meanwhile, we'll put this recording together. Yeah? Send me an email when you have your great stories because I know you're going to have them. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So thank you all. Um, sorry again about the technical difficulties, but hopefully we've got some great information, something you can use right now. And says, will you email the slides? Yeah, watch for an email for everybody that was registered. We'll give you a link where you can get the recording and the slides that we used today. So thank you all. Appreciate you coming and we will see you next month. Mm -hmm.